This episode of the Construction Record is brought to you by the Greater Toronto Sewer and Water Main Contractors Association. Clean water, our goal, our future. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Construction Record Podcast. I am digital and media editor Warren Fry, and with me today I have... Um, hi, I'm Nancy Novak and I'm Chief Innovation Officer at Compass Data Centres. And we're going to talk today about uh, what's involved in building data centers. I was saying off air that I'm sure most people, and myself included to a certain extent, think it's, it's a box of computers in it. There's a whole lot more to it than that, I'm sure. So if you could maybe walk us through the, the process of building a data center. Well, data centers, they're really not that complicated. They just have a lot of infrastructure, meaning the mechanical electrical plumbing is very heavy, but you're correct in describing them as a large box that um, is robust and um, is able to protect um, a huge array of servers. And that's how we communicate these days. But I'm assuming there's a whole lot of HVAC and cooling and plumbing, like you said, that there's just, that's more than say like a house or an even office building. There's what more considerations there at play. Well, yeah, in the construction world, you know, typically when we do commercial projects and even industrial projects, the percent of labor is typically and value of the job is typically somewhere in the 40 to 50 percent would be mechanical electrical plumbing on a data center it's more in the 70 plus percent so yeah the heavy lift is is in the equipment and the infrastructure for the fiber and the electrical and um, all of the um you know the the, the systems that, that allow it to function um, and then the mm-hmm. smaller part is the structure itself uh, and I would assume, uh, again, in the last year and a half, with how everybody's working remotely, and there's a whole lot more online shopping, and a, a, a bunch of stuff went online that wasn't online before or was less online before. COVID-19 has kind of changed the game in a lot of ways. I would assume it's no bigger way than building data centers, which I would, I would guess there's a lot more demand for. Yeah, the crazy thing is, Warren, that um, data centers have always been a very hot you know, commodity in the past you mm-hmm. know, few decades here, um, but COVID did amplify the need for um, you know being able to transmit data um, nowadays we just this is this is um this is how we live it's no different than power or water mm-hmm. um, it's it's almost impossible to apply for a job without you know having access to you know the internet um, to do things like it's uh, even getting a COVID vaccine you have to go and log in online so mm-hmm. you can imagine the digital divide is a really big concern but it absolutely has um, you know made the demand for data centers even greater. Um, in a in a very fast way, uh, so a lot of the spare capacity got you know used up right away when COVID mm-hmm. hit, and um, and so now we're looking to be able to put more work in place so that we can continue expanding at the pace that these um the large hyperscalers and enterprise clients need to. And in terms of the external environment, is there an ideal location like say I don't know, Arizona, a desert or something, or or is it does it doesn't really matter at this point? Can you pretty much put a data center anywhere? Um, it's it's really all about power and fiber. So um, you can put a data center anywhere as long as you have power and fiber. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, innovatively though, looking at you know some of the edge t- um, technology that's coming forward, um, some of this is actually not going to be the you know the the typical subsea cable type fiber, but it'll be you know used with um, satellites. Will be um, you know having um, allow us the ability to access the internet and um, and other ways to be able to transmit information which is exciting because that will absolutely help, you know, a lot of the global communities that doesn't have the hard infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Meaning more remote work from more remote places, I would assume, amongst other things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's over 5 billion people in the world who have no access to the internet. And, um, and that's kind of where a lot of our clients are trying to, you know, get to. So, um, you know, because it is the great, it's supposed to be the great equalizer and we're hoping that that stays that way. Now, besides connectivity, what are some of the more uh, prevalent trends, like the future of data centers uh, in terms of building and in terms of maintaining them? So um, mostly data centers are built to be, like I said, very robust um, because they have to be able to withstand, you know, different types of environments and different types of um, attacks. Um, And the data that is, you know, saved, collected, used, applied, and distributed is very sensitive in most cases. So... So they're very secure facilities and going forward, you know, because the data center industry understands, you know, that they consume a lot of energy 
and then in some cases, a lot of water. Um, at Compass Edison, we do we have waterless systems because we know water is very important to our environment, so we don't we don't consume a lot of water. But many data centers do. Um, mm -hmm. So going forward, you know, that we're looking at ways to be more sustainable, um, both with our structure, meaning like you know ways to embody carbon um, in consumption, you know, ways to look at you know coming off the grid and being more sustainable from a carbon footprint standpoint, and also like looking into zero waste programs and things like that. To allow the construction industry to, to keep up with, with not just with the times, but also with the you know the stewardship of the environment. Uh, we talked about the high demand for data centers. Have you seen with like the worldwide chip shortage and with ex increasing cost of construction materials? Has that been sort of a counter lever, or has that been a problem you've had to deal with? Well, we absolutely are having issues um, with the supply chain all around the globe, and it's, you'll be amazed at the different types of issues. They're all very different. Um, but all very critical. So yes, everybody is being challenged with um, getting product, getting equipment. Um, the chips are one of the largest, you know, crises that we have um, currently. And COVID um, also amplified that. It didn't cause it, mm -hmm. but it amplified it. Um, so yeah, and that's. But again, it hasn't slowed any demand down. It's just um, you know trying to work with you know diversifying supply chains and figuring out ways that we can um, circumvent some of this by buffering our schedules with you know, pre-orders well in advance um, so that we have things at the ready that can be um, deployed anywhere we need them. And you mentioned sustainability and one of the biggest uses is Bitcoin and not to speak to Bitcoin specifically, but it's one example people cite where it's like, this is comp computational power that is adding to environmental problems. Is there any, are there, besides that, how, how do you A, address environmental problems caused by data centers? Because it is churning through a bunch of power and 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 etc. Uh, and and how do you kind of work forward to make sure that isn't an issue? Yeah, I'm a Bitcoin is an interesting one because it, um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of um, machine learning, machine mining, you know, computer mining basically, mm -hmm. and then artificial intelligence and that type of thing. And that does create a, a very dense, you know, a churning of the equipment. So it creates more heat. And that requires, you know, more intense cooling, which requires more power typically. So those are those are things that, you know, it's hard. It, once technology is on the go, it's hard to, you know, jump in front of that. So, mm -hmm. so there, are, um, you know, there's many ways that we're looking at doing different types of cooling. There's some very creative um, companies out there that are looking at ways to be able to adapt to that. You know, even with a data center such as compasses where we don't use water or use some mm -hmm. types of you know, selective immersion, immersion cooling and that type of thing. Um, in addition, from a sustainable standpoint, and, you know, if we're just talking consumption, you know, um, I, <laughs> I've spent the last year studying every which way um, that we could come off the grid and or be less, um, you know, less of a carbon footprint mm -hmm. um, by, you know, whether it's through microgrids or battery energy storage or you know, using um, alternate backup, um, you know, energy sources. Um, so there's lots of things in the works. Um, some of them are a bit aspirational and some of them are, are already on the books and being deployed. So um, so here we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, how to pilot some of these because the reliability factor is so great with these data centers that sometimes it's a little tricky, but we do have some great clients who are very interested in, in deploying this. And so where we have you know, configurations with N plus two, you can always take the second N and then and say, let's make that, you know, the backup backup plan and figure mm -hmm. out ways to be more sustainable with that and pilot those things until they become normalized. Well, and speaking of clients, I'm sure there's probably some you can't talk about, but what are some of the clients you can talk about? Because the, the, the data centers don't normally get a day in the sun, so let's give them one. <laughs> well, I mean, I can't talk about any specific clients on a specific project in a specific mm -hmm. location. Sure. But, um, you know, there, there are well known, there are five um, hyperscalers and a few more right on the heels of them. Um, and that's the, the big five would be Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon and Facebook. So um, those are the large firms that, you know, make up more than 25 percent of the standard and poor and they are global forces. Um, and, and I have to remind people in the construction industry um, when it comes to data centers and especially hyperscale, meaning the large, large data centers, you know, they're fairly new in our industry as far as construction is concerned. Um, mm -hmm. They're, you know, the iPhone was invented in 2007 and um, the hyperscale data center is probably uh, a decade or less old. So as far as, you know, these gigantic global forces entering the construction field with a, with a heavy, heavy hand, 
um, this is still fairly new for our industry and we're trying to adapt to it. And I think it's exciting because it's giving us, it's kind of pushing us to get better and it's giving us opportunity to finally improve, you know, how we perform our work and become more efficient. And, you know, my, and my um, desire is to become more inclusive. That um, actually pushes me to three more questions. First, if you could define hyperscale for an audience who doesn't know what it is. Uh, second, what are you looking for in a subcontractor or people who are working with you in building these projects? Like, because I assume you need have specific needs that say, just generic contractor Inc. doesn't have. Well, so hyperscale is large. It's just it's a very so it's um it, it's like I said, the clients that I mentioned are very large, and they it's mm -hmm. interesting they have very different business models of very similar um, use cases when it comes to storing data and um, being able to use that data um, in different ways. Um, and then um, as far as like, you know, who we look for and partners, um, you know, out there, you know, we're very culture oriented and we're looking for, you know, partners who um, kind of understand, um, you know, the speed of the, the, necessary, the necessary speed that we need, um, the ability to um, site adapt quickly and you know the ability to have enough bandwidth in the industry to be able to procure things um, and also be very safe. So those mm -hmm. are the things that we that we really prioritize. And um, and culturally, we just we want partners who are very open and transparent with us because um, when it comes to construction, as everybody listening to this podcast probably knows, we are a very siloed industry, and it, and it does create mm -hmm. a lot of. Um, you know, secret sauce kind of thing that goes on. And, you know, since there's there's so much work right now globally for all these reasons, um, not just the ones I mentioned, that um, there's enough for everybody and it's really time for our industry to improve. Okay, and that leads into this question of inclusivity. Maybe you could go further and diversity. Maybe you could go further into that. Well, yeah, so it's, um, you know, th there's been a global shortage of, you know, skilled trades for um, for quite some time, we've we've noticed the trend for the past few decades, but honestly, it's never been worse than it is today. Um, so again, shame on us if we don't take advantage of this and try to figure out how to become more diverse and uh, diversity in all in all areas. But in particular, I do focus on the gender diversity, um, primarily because only three percent of the skilled trades are women, and I think it might even be lower mm -hmm. than that now after COVID, because COVID did hit us hard. A lot of people mm -hmm. left the industry, aren't coming back. We have an aging trade force without a lot of bench, you know, um, to come forward. So trying to make the industry that's very old and stodgy, something that's more attractive, something that um, that was very respectful. Um, I like to look at the trades people like professional athletes, you know, that, um, that we really respect what they do and treat them accordingly um, because we're trying to attract a really good uh, skilled labor force. And I always say like, you know, on the business case side, um, you know, these large companies that we're trying to put work in place for, you know, money's not keeping them from expanding and reaching their goals. Putting work in place is what's keeping them from doing that. And we need to be more creative, whether it's whether it's looking at things like advanced work packaging, prefabrication, offsite modular construction, or just diversifying our workforce so we can get more skilled trades. Um, all of those things are going to be needed if they want to achieve the goals that they have. And if we want to be able to on a global scale, bring everybody the same um, opportunities with the internet that we all experience here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, if people want to find out more about Compass Data Centers and what you do, where should they go? Um, you can go to compassdatacenters.com, and that's compassdatacenters, um, plural, dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, we're located, our headquarters is in Dallas, Texas, and um, I think you can find all the uh, information you need right there. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us. This episode of The Construction Record is brought to you by the Ontario Sewer and Water Main Construction Association. Clean water is everybody's business.